Hey everybody, it is late at night and I am Norman. It is time, once again, for some watch news. So let us begin. The first article I have comes to us from Fratello Watches. And this article is actually part of a long list of related articles that go in chronological order and outline exactly what it's like to build a watch brand. And they're written by a person who is doing it. I haven't read through the other articles yet. I'm going to have to go back and do that. There's quite a few of them, but it'd be really interesting to follow the course from the beginning to the end of this person building a brand. This particular article comes near the end and it discusses the logistics of releasing the piece, putting it out there for review and promotion, and actually setting up the mechanism to allow people to pre-order the watches. So how this works is the deals that this person had made, and the brand name by the way, is Vernustus per Constantium. And I think it means beauty and patience or something, if I remember right from the article. But yeah, from the deals that the author has put together for this watch, it's a batch of 300 pieces that he's going to be producing. And unfortunately, he has to do pre-sales on it, and he has to do exactly 300 sales. If he goes over that, then there's risks involved in extending the batch. So what he'll do if he gets a lot of interest and more than 300 orders is he'll start working on a second batch of 300. But he has to have 300 orders and have them prepaid so that he could afford to have the batch run, which means that people who order these watches are going to have to wait about six to eight months before they receive them. Which is brutal, but pretty exciting when it finally comes in. At the time of the writing of this article, all of the components have been produced and they were currently off being assembled. He then goes on to outline the media tour for the watches. So we'll be sending three pieces out to media for free promotion, basically. They'll do reviews of the watches share their opinions of them and whatnot. And for most media outlets, in order for them to take on free promotions like this, they generally ask a couple things. One, news value. That being that the watches haven't really been shared prior to this, so they kind of get the scoop. They're one of the first ones to discuss this piece and actually have it to show to people in photos or video or whatnot. And also, it has to be actionable news, so people have to be able to actually pre-order these pieces in response to the article or video. So it's a tightrope as far as the timeline goes. So what's going to happen is they'll send the watches out, but there will be an embargo on them. So the media outlets can't do anything with them yet until he gets everything lined up for pre-sales then the embargo will be lifted and they can do their articles or videos. But yeah, I'm gonna have to go through all of these because this article was pretty interesting and I'll go back to the very beginning and kind of work my way through them. If you would like to read them, there's a link to this particular article in the description below. At the end of the article, all of the related articles are listed in order and obviously linked off to those articles. Next up, we have a review from Time and & Watches, and this is an AP Tamara watch. Tamara, however her name is pronounced. And the result of this collaboration is a very unique watch. At least the dial is super unique. Well, the case is too. Fine, the watch is unique. So this was created in collaboration with Tamara Ralph, and she's a hot coacher fashion designer. Now I went through and kind of looked up what I could find of her different fashion pieces and the work that she does. And most of them look familiar. They look like other pieces that I've seen. Some of them look like dresses that you would see in, say, Beetlejuice. 
lots of black and whites or lots of florally looking pieces. I didn't really see anything that stood out as unique, something I've never seen before. They just looked like fancy dresses that you see on any fashion runway or fashion design lists. But then again, I don't really follow fashion, so maybe these are groundbreaking designs? I'm not sure. But getting back to the watch, I do like the different colors in the dial, and I love the depth of the dial. So it consists of offset circles that get smaller and smaller and deeper into the dial as they move toward the bottom center of it. I find the case to be really weird. If these are going to be sold as ladies watches and fancy dressy ladies watches, it's weird to have an over the top Thule case on there. I don't recall the exact watch that I've seen similar cases on. I want to say it was one of the vintage Rolex Ultra Deep pieces. But it's a strange shape. It looked weird in that other watch that I had seen it on and it looks weird in this one as well. There's a tourbillon at the 6 o'clock and I'm generally not a fan of open heart complications even if you're showing off a tourbillon. I just feel like it looks weird. I would rather see a date window than an open heart window, personally. But these watches are limited to 100 pieces and the price for them is available on demand. Uh oh, that's not good. Next up, we have a watch that was created by Monart. Monart? Monart? You know, pronouncing different brands and whatnot is brutal. But I'm gonna go with Monart. These are Thule diverish watches that have amazing dials on them. I mean, just look at those dials. That is so crazy. I personally like the green dial variant. It's just a great hue of green and looks really nice with the texture that they have going on these. The guilloche pattern and the rings that are kind of cut into it. And the applied indices look really great on the green dial as well. That silver looks so good, kind of floating in that green textured dial there. And it's cool that they cut into the rehot. I really liked how the original version of the Pelagos did that as well had the hour markers cut in to the rehot. It just looks kind of cool. It's not something that you see in most pieces, so it kind of catches your eye. The date window at the six o'clock is well executed. The hands are unique and cool looking. I really like the seconds hand. And these have metal bezels on them, which I've never really been a fan of, but recently I keep seeing a metal bezel here and there that I actually really like. I think originally I was put off by metal bezels due to the 1990s designs that came out where there were just chunks and blobs of metal coming off of the bezels and everything looked organic and Martian-y and just horrible. But lately some of the metal bezels, did I say dial earlier? If I did, I meant bezel. But lately there have been quite a few metal bezels out there that just look like really precise machined metal design and they actually look really good. Especially the ones that are the narrower bezels with the smaller numbers etched into them. Those are really cool. And this one is not bad looking at all. The movement inside these watches is an in-house regulated ETA 2824. The water resistance is 300 meters. The crystal on these is sapphire. And the pricing on these is interesting because there's actually two different sets of these watches. In the article, I didn't really notice what the difference was. Yeah, I'll have to scrutinize the photos and whatnot a little bit more to see what the difference is between the limited edition versus the regular production pieces. But the pricing for the regular production pieces, retail cost is $1,605. The super early bird price for them is $1,292. The early bird edition is $1,345. Pre-order is $1,399. 
and the limited edition retail is 2144 but there's also early bird and pre-sale prices for those as well. The next article comes from Deployant.com, and this is a write-up of a Bell & Ross watch, the BR03 Cyber Ceramic Watch. I'm generally not a huge Bell & Ross fan. Most of their pieces are just big, chunky, and kind of weird looking. I appreciate their unique aesthetic, and I'm sure that there are plenty of people out there that absolutely love their designs. I'm just not one of them. However, I actually like this piece. I like the sci-fi shape of the case and their choice to go just all blacked out with this watch. This piece is skeletonized, so the dial's pretty busy, but the dial is done all dark as well, so it kind of looks cool and fits the sci-fi aesthetic of this piece. And it also looks really good on that strap. This whole thing just looks like it would have come out of a sci-fi movie or some old cyberpunk movie. Just super cool. The hands do kind of get lost in there, but I really like the style of the hands they went with. They're a bit skeletonized themselves, however the loom fills up most of that open space in the center of the hands. These watches have 42 millimeter ceramic cases, so I imagine they would wear pretty large, being that square shaped, well, octagon shape. The crystal on them is sapphire, and they have 50 meters of water resistance. But being Bell & Ross, these pieces go for almost $14,000. So I will not ever have one of these sitting on my sci-fi shelf. I would have to be like stupid rich to have one anyway because it would sit on my sci-fi shelf most of the time. So I will have paid $14,000 for a piece of decoration on a shelf that I might wear a couple times a year. But they do look kind of cool. The last article I have comes from Wristwatch Review. And this is a write-up of a Frederic Constant Slimline Perpetual Calendar Watch. And I agree with the reviewer, the author of this article, this dial is just way too busy. There's so much going on, it just is barely legible. And I understand it's a perpetual calendar, so there's a lot of data to be displayed, but other watches do a much better job of keeping the dial as clean as possible. I mean, one, you could put some of the date information behind windows, so the rest of the dial can be smooth and legible. But FC kind of went with a skeletonized, everything is visible design. And they decided to make the hands skeletonized. And I get that as well, so that you can read the data that's below them. The hands just kind of vanish. They end up being camouflaged with the rest of the crazy, busy dial. This piece was done in collaboration with Peter Speak. And I glanced around at some of his other designs, and they're kind of similar. And if you look at this watch, it has just a crown, so I'm not sure if maybe hidden on the side of the case are mechanisms for setting the perpetual calendar. If not, that could be a nightmare. This could be one of those pieces where you literally have to keep the watch running all the time, where you're going to have to sit there forever just moving through days, months, years, to get the perpetual calendar back to where it needs to be. I remember hearing a story about one where the watch had been asleep since the 90s, so in order to set that calendar, you would have to sit there and spin that movement through 15 years at the time, 20 years, 30 years, whatever it was, between the time that it fell asleep to when the person who purchased it was going to try and set that calendar. Other than that, you would have to have a watchmaker open it up and reposition all the wheels so that it's caught up. And I know some perpetual calendars have mechanisms of kind of speeding up the process, of catching up the date, year, month, whatever, to the current date. But I don't know if this one has that. I may have to do a little bit of research into this piece and see if that is the case. Nothing about setting the perpetual calendar is mentioned in this article that I saw. Of course, I have a bad habit of skimming, 
So there might have been a note about that in there, but I feel like if I was going to review a perpetual calendar watch, I would definitely mention how difficult it is to set the current date. Because you have to cycle through years and months and whatnot. Otherwise it won't be correct. These watches have 42 millimeter cases on them. They have a case height of 12 millimeters. The water resistance on these is 30 meters. And the movement inside them is an FC775. So it's an in-house movement. But here is another criticism that the author had that I totally agree with. This particular piece is over $11,000, which is interesting coming from a brand that usually positions itself as accessible, kind of entry-level mid-tier watches. So it's kind of a reach to have something this expensive. And I believe this isn't the only one. I've seen other pretty expensive Frederic Constant watches, but I don't know if I've seen one at $11,000. It's been quite a while since I've gone through their catalog. I may have to peruse it and kind of pay attention to the prices just, just to know what kind of range they're at today. They may have plenty of other pieces that are over $10,000 for all I know. But this one is just so busy. Ugh. So there you have it. You are now caught up on the news. Thanks for watching.